Thanks, Joan. Oh, sure. Great. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here representing the San Antonio chapter of the Native Plant Society as uh, part of the fifth annual Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival. And I'm going to be talking about uh, ways that you can invite butterflies, birds, bees, and other guests into your yard using native plants. So who are your guests? A lot of people in our area and other areas are really interested in attracting monarch butterflies. And as you've probably already figured out, um, wh whether or not you saw the note on the lower right, this is not a monarch butterfly, um, but this is a butterfly that we have locally that tends to have these pretty massive migrations in the fall about the same time that the monarchs are migrating through. And so uh, people hear about the monarchs coming through and they see these many thousands of butterflies um, moving and uh, think that they are also monarchs. But when you look at them up close, they're quite different. Um, this is called the American snout, and it doesn't have uh, such a long migration as the monarchs. It's more of a local migration. But this plant in the photo is actually a monarch plant. This is one of our local native milkweeds called Texas milkweed. And this is a plant that somebody might select if it matched their uh, conditions of their, their, their space um, in an attempt to maybe provide for monarch butterflies. But the beauty about this is that any, any native plant you select that supports monarch butterflies is going to be supporting an entire community of other organisms and other insects. And so it's really good to think about any of these native plants that you're selecting and putting in your landscape as a community, not just the plant. It is going to bring in a wide variety of predominantly insects, um, but some other, other critters as well. Pollinators are pretty popular now too, pollinator gardens. And in our area, uh, insect pollinators are, are uh, the, the, the largest proportion of the animal pollinators. And most people are familiar with pollinators like bees and bumblebees and butterflies. But there are a lot of other insects that also pollinate, including flies, beetles, wasps, and, and others. Uh, this is a bumblebee. It's got a, its face right in there, probably doing some pretty good pollinating of this plant. I'll be highlighting this plant actually a little bit later. And many people also want to attract hummingbirds. And there are a number of native plants that are really great at bringing in hummingbirds. In our area, we have a one species that will uh, stay here in the summer and breed, and that's the black-chinned hummingbird. But during the fall and spring migrations, we have others, other hummingbirds that will pass through. Now, what's interesting to note here about what's going on with this particular plant, this is Turk's cap. And uh, you can see that the hummingbird is touching this part of the plant that has the pollen on it. This is the structure that will, that needs to be pollinated. And so you can see that this hummingbird is a pretty good pollinator probably of this particular flower. It's gonna come in, it's gonna get some pollen on its head and then it's gonna move to another flower. And there's a good chance that that's going to end up in pollination and the production of seed. It's also important to know that a pollinator might be visiting your plant, but it doesn't mean that that plant is getting pollinated. And this is that same flower. This is that Turk's cap. This is our beautiful Gulf fritillary butterfly. This is one of the easiest butterflies to attract in our area, very simply. And I'm gonna talk about plants that will do that in a little while. Um, but you can see that this butterfly is coming in, getting some nectar, but it's nowhere near this. It's not going to be an effective pollinator and that's okay. Again, we already know that that hummingbird came through and probably did a great job of pollinating. So this butterfly doesn't need to be pollinating. Again, each plant is a community and each uh, piece of that community might be doing different things to benefit each other. Now, where there are insects, there are gonna be predators of insects. And one of the best predators or uh, most effective predators is a, a spider. And most people do not care for spiders, which is why I chose a pretty photo of a spider web um, because many people uh, just instinctively kill them, right? 
uh, indiscriminate, not even looking at what species that might be, whether it's out in the garden or, or anywhere, they just automatically kill them. And, and that's unfortunate because spiders are a really important food source for birds and other critters. Another one of our local uh, predators is the uh, green anole. And these are beautiful creatures that can change from brown to green, lots of different shades very quickly to camouflage in the plants. You can see here it's blending in really well with one of our native plants. So it's just waiting for those pollinators to come to the flower so it could possibly have a meal. And then of course birds. Um, Insects are a critical part of the diet uh, for all birds, um, most birds. Even hummingbirds eat insects, which many people are surprised to find out. I know I was when I first found that out. Um, but birds rely on a lot of insects, particularly when they're raising young or during the migration. And in fact, this is a black crested pit mouse that uh, we observe getting a uh, some sort of a, a larva, maybe moth or something that it had pulled out of this, this case here. And we had watched these birds going through uh, the vegetation and picking out and eating, just devouring lots of these different larvae. And so different larva caterpillars have been shown to be really, really important for uh, the um, birds and particularly during uh, raising young again and during the migration when they really need uh, to have fuel to continue their migration. Okay, so those are some of the guests that you might intentionally try to invite to your garden. Um, and then there will be some guests that will show up uninvited and you just need to be aware of that so that you know what all is going on and um, can manage it uh, the way that you want to. So what's on the menu? Well, uh, the plants provide a, a lot of different types of food items, and those include leaves, buds, pollen, nectar, sap, fruit, nuts, seeds. And I know some of the plant people here are probably cringing because um, they're saying that all nuts are fruits and most nuts are seeds, but not all seeds are nuts and whatnot, but just go with it here. Just the, the, There's a lot of different um, opportunities provided by these plants to, to, to different organisms. So these are our vegetarian guests, right? And some of the guests that, that come in and, and are eating our plants become food items themselves. And so, as I mentioned, insects and spiders are really important food sources, particularly for birds. And so what you need to do here to provide for these opportunities is put the plants out, select ones that you know are gonna uh, potentially attract the, the species that you're interested in bringing in. And then when the insects and the spiders all show up, don't kill them. So that's all you have to do, just don't kill them. Now, I do have to point out, this is from the standpoint of um, healthy plant communities and, and the, com the, the system, the ecosystem. Um, if you are growing food for yourself and for human consumption, that's a whole different issue and you're going to manage things differently because you can't just let all of the insects come and eat all of your food. So this is about, so it's a, that's a separate um, approach. This is about what can you do to really maximize those benefits and provide those um, opportunities for, for other organisms in the yard. And so what that is uh, really is variety. So as any good buffet would have, there would be a variety of options that uh, the guests could come in and you would most likely, if you've got a lot of variety, have options that they would use. In a natural plant community, um, we call that uh, biodiversity, that variety in species. You can achieve variety in a couple of ways. And so species diversity is, is one of those ways. And native species biodiversity is, is really important. It's, it's um, being looked at, it's, it's a cause for concern. We're seeing a de decrease globally in species biodiversity. And um, locally, it's those, those local uh, ecosystems and plant communities that are really important to focus in on. And so you've got all of these diverse plants. Another way to 
achieve variety is through structural diversity or structural variety. And so in this case, we've got some species up in the, the canopy layer, the upper layer, tree species. We've got some understory species and shrubs in the midstory. And then we've got some ground cover. And some animals that might come in here might only use the, the top of the canopy trees. Other species might come in and use every bit of this environment. At the same time, some species might only be coming in for a small portion of the year. Maybe it's even just part of a day or maybe less than an hour. Um, other species might be coming in and staying quite a bit longer. And so having this variety provides for those opportunities. And really, it's important to think about what you've got going on year round and what you're providing year round. You don't have, to have trees to have structural variety. Um, this is an example of a, a restored prairie system along the San Antonio River. And this is a mix of native and non-native here, but you can see there's a diversity of species. And you can see that even though there aren't any trees, we've still got structural diversity. We've got low growing things and, and uh, thicker, taller. And so there is a, a wide amount of variety here and opportunities for your, your guests in a prairie system as well. You can also achieve these through a more formalized garden setting. This is a local demonstration garden at the San Antonio River Authority offices in downtown San Antonio. And you can see here again, we've got some species diversity and we've got some structural diversity here to provide a multiple opportunities and it's attractive. Okay, so one of the most common questions we get at the Native Plant Society is, uh, what is native? And the simplest way to think about it is that uh, we look to the historical um, conditions prior to the major land disturbing activities that, that altered these communities. Um, in our area, this is a few hundred years back is generally what we look at. And this is an example of some great, uh, of a great map that is prepared by the US Environmental Protection Agency. You can access these maps online very easily. This is what's called the level one eco uh, sorry, ecological regions of North America. And you can see here, this kind of uh, orangey uh, uh, area. This is the Great Plains ecoregion. And San Antonio is somewhere like right around here. But you could see where some species that would be considered native in San Antonio, uh, because they were part of the Great Plains system, they might be the same species at, that is native up, at, up here in Canada and upper, upper Midwest areas. Now, we generally go to a little more detail in what's called the level three ecoregions. And again, this is readily available online. You can, if you're in the United States, you can look this up. And this is a great resource to just try to understand what types of plants might be most suitable for your location. Zooming in on just Texas level three ecoregions, we are here in San Antonio in Bear County. And you can see that we are at a location where multiple ecoregions are coming together. Um, other places, you can see over here in West Texas, there's uh, really just one type classified here. Um, in systems like this, where you've got multiple ecoregions coming together, things are really dynamic. They're really dynamic anyways. Plants move around, just usually a little bit slower than, and than the animals, but everything's constantly moving and changing. And it, it's not really right to think about all of this being in harmony with each other because you know, there's uh, animals eating the plants, it's all working together. Sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive, but with uh, these communities, if they're in healthy conditions and we've got that biodiversity, um, the thing is that uh, it's more likely to be able to persist through time. And that's what we're trying to go for. We're trying to conserve that native species biodiversity and keep our native um, plants and animals. So we use those maps as guidance. Of course, we know, you know, those maps, most, most of those historic or much of the area uh, shown in those historical ecoregion maps um, has been altered and changed. And we've changed the landscape significantly for our, our own uses. So we've done a lot of damage. We continue to do a lot of damage, um, but we're also the solution. We know that there are better ways to develop. We know uh, how 
to assess and manage systems. We know how to restore systems. We know how to protect and conserve. And so we are the solution. And that's what we're talking about today is um, things that we can do as individuals and in our communities. And one of the simplest things we can do is bring back native plants and ensure that these native plants are just distributed throughout our areas. Another important thing to point out here is the, the connectivity. And so not only have we damaged and, and altered and converted, uh, we have fragmented. And so where we once had a lot of connected communities, uh, native natural plant communities, they're now uh, fragmented, um, isolated. Um, and so it's good to think about ways to try to connect those together in any community. So what can you do? Well, you can create a year-round buffet. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you some plants in just a little bit for our area. What else can you do? This is my new favorite thing. I learned it from Doug Tallamy's uh, presentation as part of the festival. If you haven't seen it, it's recorded and you can get it on the, the festival website. It's awesome. Uh, if you don't know how important caterpillars are or how urgent the situation is for birds, uh, you should watch it. Um, and he said, grow caterpillars. And I, I absolutely love that. So how do you grow caterpillars? Well, you give them the plants they need to eat. So a lot of times, uh, many caterpillars are host specific, meaning they only eat one type of plant. Uh, monarch butterflies are a good example. Uh, they will lay their eggs on milkweeds and those caterpillars will feed on the milkweeds. And monarchs will not lay eggs on anything that's not a milkweed. Now they have uh, many species of milkweed to choose from depending on uh, where they are. I think we have something like 30 in Texas, but really in our local area, there's only two that are pretty um, common and um, are, are preferred by the monarch. Um, in this case, this is a vine sphinx caterpillar. This is a, um, will become a moth and it is specific to plants in the grape family. And I've uh, found it in my yard. I found it out in natural areas. It's feeding on a plant called cow itch vine or sorrel vine, which is in the grape family. And it's a big caterpillar, <laughs> as you can see. This is the adult. I just found this adult um, maybe about a week ago. And, uh, uh, and so you grow caterpillars. Um, those caterpillars, again, become food. So not all of the caterpillars will become adults, but here's an adult. And an important thing you can do in your yard to help support moths like this and many other insects is to leave the leaves. Leaf litter is really important for a protective cover for uh, things like these moths as they overwinter and other insects. It uh, helps to serve as food and cover. So wherever you can, start leaving those leaves. If you wanna rake them up and put them in and use them as mulch, that's an excellent way to allow those leaves to provide these opportunities. And I have seen these um, uh, vine sphinx is in the past. Uh, the first time I saw one in my yard was about four years ago and really started actively um, leaving leaves in certain areas probably about uh, six or seven years ago. So I know it's working in my yard. All right, what else can you do? Well, plant natives. Um, that's what we're here to talk about. I'm going to be highlighting 10 uh, uh, species, uh, native species for our area in just a minute. And I'm gonna just ask Joan if there's any need to pause here for any questions, if there are any, otherwise I'll just keep going. Uh, let's see, The um, there was one quick question about the anole. Um, oh. Is there a difference, do you know the difference between anoles and geckos? Oh, well, <laughs> not there, there was a link to, posted. Not so enough to might, explain. You well. there. There, there was a link posted, so that oh, might good. be. Oh, good. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, not enough to explain. Well, they, they are different species, and I could talk about some really cool things about each, but no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not knowledgeable enough to really do that justice. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. And, and and someone asked about what did you say about them? And I think it was really just that there's they are predators in your garden, right? Yes, they're one of the common ones in our area. You'll see them uh, well, a, lot of, a lot of times. They'll be out. 
and they can blend in so easily with our vegetation. In fact, I've taken photos of what I thought, you know, I was looking at an insect, insect up close and it was only when I uploaded the photos that I noticed there was a green anole right behind it, you know, waiting to eat it or something. Yeah. They <laughs> are camouflage masters and uh, they're one of my favorite critters, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, if you don't have any pets, they sort of are a substitute, I find, you know. <laughs> But um, just one, one other little question here. It's kind of a big one in a way. How will does climate change affect what is considered native? Oh, That's gosh. a good one to unpack. We could do a day long workshop on yeah. that. Um, definitely it's going to have an impact. You know, we uh, in uh, people working with native plants are starting to think about how do we start bringing in, uh, what's the best way to bring in native plants to possibly uh, respond to increases in temperatures and, and um, other extremes. And so uh, you can look at uh, native plants that are in, uh, for us, it would be a little bit south of here, species that um, do well in South Texas, uh, or West Texas might be good candidates to try to put here, but it is really complicated. And, and in our area, we have a lot of species that do well here, north of here, east of here, and all the way to the, to, to the West where we have really extreme differences in moisture from East to West um, and North to South in Texas. So we do know that we've got a lot of species. Now, these, uh, some of these species tend to be ones that people don't care for or think are trash trees or whatever, honey mesquite, uh, wistach, ratama, uh, uh, and others. They, they can tolerate these conditions. And so we, we can look to those plants and, and um, maybe help to um, be prepared. Uh, but it's complicated and, and uh, yeah, I mean, we could talk for days probably on that. It's something we need to pay attention to though. Uh, again, it really just comes back to choosing the native plants that are appropriate for your area and thinking about um, short-term conditions, but also what, what do we think is gonna happen in the, in the future and, and choosing accordingly. Well, that was a great answer. Um, okay, I say go, let's let's move on okay. to the next part. Let's move on, we got 10 plants. Let's see, where are we are on time? Okay. All right, the first plant I'm gonna highlight here is Mexican plum. Uh, this is a tree, an uh, understory tree. So uh, this tree really does best on, on the edges of woodlands. That's where you see it in natural areas. Uh, it can take full sun, um, but it prefers that edge. So it's kind of a, a part shade. It can grow up to 35 feet, but usually it's around 15 uh, or 20 feet or so. This is one of our first bloomers in our area. And so that's why I picked it because it starts, it can start blooming um, in February, sometimes earlier if we've got some weird weather happening. Um, and those insects will find it. So it is one of the first and it attracts bees, butterflies, and then it produces plums, which attract the birds. And so in the spring, what happens is it gets covered in these beautiful white flowers and the entire tree is covered. And the flowers come out before the leaves come out. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful tree. Here's a red admiral enjoying some nectar on, on a Mexican plum. Here's the plums. They really aren't that tasty. They're really tart, but people make jelly, jams and jellies with them, you know, add a bunch of sugar and whatnot. Uh, this is a good food source for birds and uh, mammals. Uh, squirrels love to eat these things. Um, uh, they're really attractive though too. Ornamental on the tree. And they don't get a real vibrant color change, but they will get a yellowish color in the fall you can see here. And, and this was something we observed last fall in the demonstration garden at the, at the uh, River Authority's demonstration garden downtown. And you can see here, this is a migrating warbler. I'm not good with birds, so I don't remember which one it is, I'm sorry. But look how it, it, it blends in, it matches it. It, it was able to um, 
find a place and seek some cover and probably some food, uh, insects, um, on, during its migration. All right, the next one is Cenizo. This plant goes by a lot of different names. Uh, Texas sage is another common name that's used. Uh, barometer bush is used. Uh, this is an amazing, amazing shrub. Um, it grows generally to be about three to six feet tall. Uh, it can get taller than that. There are a lot of varieties out in the trade and you can find compact varieties and others. Um, it's just magnificent because it has the potential to bloom January through December. And that's not a constant bloom through that whole time, but what it does is it responds to rain pretty quick, uh, well, <laughs> it responds to rain and so it will, it will bloom multiple times. So it'll bloom, those will die, uh, die off and then it'll get some rain and maybe uh, one to two weeks later, it'll bloom again. And sometimes, as you can see in the photos, the entire bush is covered. So it likes uh, sun apart shade as well. It attracts bees, butterflies, and it's a larval host for a couple of different butterflies. Monarchs will use it. Uh, it's not always blooming when they're coming through, um, but the times that it is, I have observed monarchs blooming, um, monarchs nectaring on it in downtown San Antonio. You'll get a lot of bees as well. Here's a neat little sweat bee, little native uh, solitary sweat bee. And while it's not really known to attract birds, shrubs in general are really good for birds. And so here's another example of uh, a bird that we witnessed in downtown San Antonio during the migration last fall. This is a wetland bird, was passing through and we were lucky, this photo was taken from inside the building. We were lucky to see this bird and it was feeding throughout these uh, Cenizo for uh, two or three days um, and then moved on hopefully on its migration. Um, it was feeding, it was finding insects all over these bushes. Another not so great photo because it was taken from the inside, but this is a really good example of the importance of cover. And again, these, these uh, shrubs really serve as good cover for birds. And this is an oven bird. This is a migratory bird. And if you can see, it's, it's resting. And so it found this Cenizo to be a safe place to rest. Um, and it probably ended up feeding on some insects in there as well, and then hopefully continued on its migration. So sometimes it's the food that you're providing directly but also just the cover can be just as significant. And here is the caterpillar of that Coletta silk moth. So Cenizo is a larval host for this species um, of moth. It's a very large moth. I didn't even know about this. I have been working with Cenizo uh, since I've been back in San Antonio for 12 years. And it, this Cenizo is everywhere. And I have not seen these caterpillars until this year. And for some reason, um, people that I've talked to also found a bunch of these. I had 12 of these caterpillars in my yard. This is one of them. And this happened right before the pandemic and um, it became a kind of a neighborhood attraction with the kids coming over because these are so beautiful and they're really giant. So, you know, they're like uh, this big also. Um, and surprisingly, even when we knew that there were five of them in one bush, it would take us a while to actually find them. Um, it's kind of surprising with these bright colors, but they blend in really well. Um, I do have one cocoon that's in a protective cage that I'm, I'm hoping to rear. I have one cocoon that's still out on the shrub. And then one of my good friends who works with butterflies has three cocoons too that she's going to rear. And we don't know how long they're gonna be in the cocoons. I haven't been able to track that down yet, um, but they've been in for some months now and we're gonna keep we're going to keep watching. They're, they're just beautiful. Okay, the next plant is Turk's cap. You've seen this already. You saw the hummingbird already feeding on it. It's really a well-known hummingbird attractor here. It can take sun to shade and generally is about three to six feet tall, but sometimes can get quite a bit taller than that. And the, the beauty of this shrub is that uh, it can take a pretty aggressive pruning um, 
and uh, so, so can the Sevenizo. I didn't mention that, but um, Turk's cat can bloom June through October. I've also seen it blooming outside of that range, and so it can sometimes start blooming much earlier. And it's usually blooming when the hummingbirds start coming back through, and it definitely is an important hummingbird food source throughout the growing season. So it attracts hummingbirds, uh, other birds for the fruits that it produces, uh, butterflies and bees. Monarchs will use it. This is a pipevine swallowtail, another large butterfly using it. Another type of swallowtail. And I have this one pop up. I, the, in the nursery, they do sell pink and I believe they sell white varieties of the flowers. I had this one just popped up in my yard from somewhere and it turned out really gorgeous. And I did see hummingbirds using it. All right, next plant is flame acanthus. And this is another very well-known hummingbird plant for our area. It takes sun to shade. This one also grows about three to five feet tall and can bloom from June to October. Attracts hummingbirds, lots of different butterflies, and it's a larval host for a couple of different butterflies here. This is a giant great orange, giant orange. Oh man, I'm really not good with butterflies either. I think it's called the giant or large orange. That's what it is, large orange sulfur. Beautiful. Pipe fine swallowtail. Here's a carpenter bee that's actually robbing some nectar. It's not, it's, uh, it's sticking its mouth parts down here at the base and stealing nectar instead of going in and pollinating. And again, that's okay because there are other critters that are actually doing the pollination of this plant. One thing I've noticed about this plant in, in multiple settings, not at my house yet, which is sad because I would love to have this green link spider at, at my house in my flame acanthus. Um, I have seen it in multiple places where these green link spiders will tend to set up their webs and have their egg cases. This is a, a female green link spider with her egg case. That egg case has hundreds of babies in it. And she's gonna guard that egg case until those babies come out. And she also guards the babies until they all move on their, their way. Um, it's pretty impressive. They're really beautiful spiders. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's because of the structure. So any of these shrubs or uh, the plants with the stronger stems, you'll tend to find the spiders moving into those. And it's a larval host here. This is a crimson patch caterpillar. Uh, looks like a zebra, really striking when you see it in person. Uh, sometimes you'll see clusters uh, when the caterpillars are younger, all together on the same branch and they'll all start moving around at the same time. In fact, that's the first, the first time I noticed it was because of that happening. I was at Harburger Park and I didn't know it was a larval host. And since then I've found these caterpillars in multiple sites uh, using this plant. Okay, the next one is mealy blue sage. This is one of my favorite. If you get any plant, it, get this one. This one, this one covers a lot of different uh, elements here. So it uh, tends to be uh, in sun to part shade. In natural areas, I see it growing along woodland edges uh, commonly. It gets to be about three feet tall, two to three feet tall, and it can bloom um, from April to October. It attracts hummingbirds, birds, butterflies, and it's been identified by the Xerxes Society as having special value for native bees. Monarchs will feed on it. Lots of other different butterflies here. You've got the red admiral on the left, common buckeye on the right. Here's a cute little skipper. I don't know what kind it is. Here's a, a bee and you can see this bee is just covered with pollen. So, so those parts on this flower are up in here. And so this bee is probably doing a pretty good job of pollinating this plant. You can see this particular bee also has put quite a bit of pollen on its abdomen. This is one of our, our native solitary bee species. Here's another bee doing the same thing. You can see that it got some pollen on its head, kind of how that hummingbird did with the Turk's cat. Same thing. 
Here's another one. This one's robbing that nectar again. So it's piercing into the base and getting that nectar, but that's fine because we already saw those other bees were doing the pollinating. So there's room for everyone here. Oh, one of my favorite uh, tarantula hawk. This is a wasp. This is, uh, it predates on tarantulas. We do have those around here. Don't usually see them very often, um, but that's why this critter's hanging around and it does feed on nectar. And so you'll see it nectaring on different plants, including this one. And this is an interesting uh, larval stage of a true bug that uh, the adult looks completely different than this. You wouldn't even think they were the same insect. Um, and I started seeing these on the mealy blue sage and I see them regularly. These are ant mimics. So this is not an ant, but it looks identical to an ant. It's actually a true bug. And if you know what that is, it's got um, certain mouth parts that, that give it away. Uh, really fascinating. When you start bringing these plants in, if you start looking, I, I encourage you to look and I encourage you to look really closely at what's going on. Um, because you'll find these amazing things happening in your garden. And you know that it's working when you see these things. It will attract uh, hummingbirds. I don't have any good shots of the hummingbird actually feeding on it, but I have seen it. I got a lot of blurry photos. <laughs> and then the other thing that this plant is known for is uh, it is a good seed and flower bud food source for um, lesser goldfinch and goldfinch. And I see the lesser goldfinch feeding on these all the time. And you might not see it. it. You really have to kind of be there when it happens because they come in and it's really quick and they, they also blend in really well and they're pretty, pretty secretive. Um, but I've seen it at Harburger Park. I've seen it in my yard. I've seen it along the river. So it definitely is. There's a connection with these uh, lesser goldfinch. Next plant is autumn sage, closely related to the mealy blue sage we just covered. This one likes sun to part shade, similar in height, two to three feet tall, can bloom for an extended period, March through November, and attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. This is a hummingbird moth. It's large, it moves really quickly, and so a lot of times you might think it was a hummingbird if you didn't catch it. They, they move really fast. It's hard to get a good photo of it. This one's pretty blurry still, but you can tell that it's not a hummingbird here. But it does attract hummingbirds. Uh, this plant does attract hummingbirds too. Here's a little hoverfly. I actually witnessed that hoverfly lay an egg. And there's the egg. It comes in different colors. There's, there's a lot of other colors too. These are the, probably the most common that I see out, uh, but there's whites, other colors that you can get. Beautiful flower. And here's that bee rubbing that nectar again, but, but again, it's fine. We got some other, other critters pollinating it. Uh, plenty of food to go around. Okay, this is the official pollinator plant for 2020, uh, Greg's Mist Flower. It is fairly well known as a butterfly magnet. You can see here, we've got some queen butterflies, a monarch butterfly, and some kind of a yellow sulfur type butterfly. Again, I don't know who that one is. <laughs> I'm not good enough with butterflies. Uh, so sun depart shade, one and a half to two feet tall. It can bloom from March to November, but it's really known for its fall bloom because that's when it brings in the, mon uh, the butterflies like crazy. It is a larval host uh, for Rawson's metal mark. And you can see here uh, the queen butterflies on the left, monarch butterflies on the right. They are of the same genus. They're very closely related. They, in fact, both use milkweeds for their larval host plant. Their caterpillars look very similar. And so uh, and it's, it's good to provide for, if you're providing for monarchs, you'll be providing for these queens also as a larval host for sure. And they share very, uh, a lot of different nectar plants, a lot of the organisms do. I've seen many times in our demonstration garden downtown where these mist flower are covered with queens so much so that they chase the monarchs away. 
So that's why it's good to have other blooming things. So when the monarchs get chased away from the mist flower, they can go over to something else like the Turk's cap or the mealy blue sage, and they can still get some food for the migration. All right, passion flower. There's, there's multiple native species. I'm gonna highlight a couple. This is a really popular one. It's absolutely gorgeous, a, amazing scent. It's called Maypop. This is another one that's uh, more commonly seen out in, uh, in the natural areas. This is called Corona de Cristo. You can see here, we've got a, a katydid nymph here and a bee that's covered in pollen and helping to pollinate these flowers. So passion flowers, uh, I've kind of combined them. This is in, a, in about one, um, but passion flower species in general, uh, like sun depart shade, they are vines. So they're gonna be sprawling along the ground or climbing up trees uh, up to 25 feet or so. They can be blooming for an extended period again, April through October, and they attract bees, butterflies, birds, lots of uh, uh, larval, it's larval host for a lot of different butterflies. This is the one that it will bring in Gulf fritillary butterflies. So if you put this out, you're almost guaranteed that you're going to get Gulf fritillary butterflies. These are the fruits of the Corona de Cristo, very ornamental. And here's that Gulf fritillary butterfly laying an egg on its larval host, passion flower. In this case, it's Corona de Cristo. Here's the baby caterpillar. That was the egg it came out of. These caterpillars grow pretty quickly and they look a little bit alarming. And I have talked to multiple people who did not know that their passion flower was going to get these critters on and they were surprised to find that these were actually uh, caterpillars of a beautiful butterfly. And so it's, when you get something like this on your plants, you, you don't, uh, many people instinctively would look at it as a pest. It's destroying, because it's eating the, the plants. It'll eat the flowers, you can see it here, and, and the leaves. Um, those impacts are usually temporary and the plant's gonna survive and regrow. But some people panic and think, well, this is a pest. And so they actually will kill these butterflies, not making that connection that that, that caterpillar would, would become a, an adult Gulf fritillary butterfly if it was left. Here's the chrysalis. All right, I've got only two more plants left. Let's check the time. Okay. Some of you are going to think I might be a little bit crazy with this one. This one's generally considered kind of a weed in our area. It's not really one that you go and buy at the nurseries, but it's one that might come into your yard. It came into my yard on its own, and I've just been uh, trying to see how I could use it in different, different ways. So it's also called purple bindweed in, in, uh, in addition to tie vine. It likes sun to part shade. It's got trailing stems that can grow to 15 feet, and it can bloom from March to December. It attracts hummingbirds, bees, bumblebees, and butterflies. I've seen out in natural areas uh, regularly, bumblebees just uh, going crazy for these flowers. And the strange thing is look how awful those flowers look. They look like they're totally spent. But I've seen a number of critters using these uh, when these flowers look this way. So they're still, even though they're uh, kind of ugly, <laughs> they are still providing for our, our pollinators and, and others. Here's a beautiful swallowtail. Again, look at look at those flowers. They look like they wouldn't even be able to, to provide anything. It looks like they're wilting, they're ready to go to seed, um, but they were definitely providing. And I was fortunate to be near Confluence Park with a bird expert, Martin Reed, um, to witness this rufous hummingbird. And so I wouldn't have even had a clue what it was because hummingbirds are, are really quick and hard to ID and they all look really similar to each other. So I wouldn't have known if I, if I wasn't with Martin. He said, that is a Rufus, we've got to get a photo. And sure enough, you know, look at the flowers again. They, they look like they're wilting. They don't look like they'd be much of anything. We usually think of this plant as a, a weedy thing. Um, and here it is providing for this Rufus hummingbird that was migrating through and needed to fuel up to keep on its migration. Here's one of our little native solitary bees. Um, I've been experimenting with it, growing on trellises, growing in um, hanging baskets. In fact, 
this is how I saw it uh, being used by hummingbirds. And so um, something to think about with some of these natives that might be coming into your yard, especially these things that are uh, kind of weedy and uh, viney, you can experiment with them on trellises and, and other ways, fencing, um, and you'll probably be pretty amazed at what happens and what, what comes in to use these plants. All right, here's the last one, and some of you are definitely gonna think I'm crazy, but I know that there are people here that, that know the importance of bull moss, and I had to include this one. Uh, this is not a plant that you're gonna go to the nursery and buy, although people do sell this online, uh, <laughs> strangely. Um, these ball moss are like their own buffet. And so I've even got one right here. I found this morning. And so one of our local environmental science teachers shared with me that he's been having students look at these. So they take these and they, they pull them apart. And in these ball moss, they find tons and tons of food sources for birds and other insects. Uh, variety of insects, arachnids, isopods, millipedes, all kinds of little critters that are going to be food. So it's like its own little buffet. Now that bird expert I mentioned to you, Martin Reed, uh, showed me that there is an interesting warbler called the worm eating warbler. Of course, it's not eating a worm, it's eating a caterpillar, but uh, regardless, um, they, he found this in, in his, uh, from his balcony in San Antonio, um, moving through during migration, finding food in the ball moss. And so you can see the distribution of this particular warbler. It's not really common even in our San Antonio area, but um, it does have the potential to be passing through. And these ball moss could actually be providing really significant food sources for migratory birds. In my own yard, I found this summer tanager uh, one of the other great things about the ball moss is that it's a uh, great cover for uh, birds and insects. Um, they, they can feel safe, they can be protected, they can rest, they can hide. Um, there are so many attributes of these ball moss that benefit migratory birds and other organisms that uh, really what I would like people to do is just not indiscriminately remove them, which is one thing that a lot of people do in our area they demoss and they remove all of these ball moss from their oak trees. And these are epiphytes, they don't cause damage um, in general. Uh, they work really well with our live oak trees. There's a partnership there. And the oak trees themselves are like their own buffet. They've, as a group, have been proven to be really important for birds because of the number of caterpillars that can be found on oaks. And then you have this other layer of ball moss, which is another form of food um, that works really well with the oaks. So I would like people just to stop indiscriminately removing them and recognize maybe they're providing some benefit and think about whether or not they wanna allow for some of those ball moss to grow. It does have a flower, it's really tiny. One of our members, Judith, gave me this photo. I've been searching for flowers for a long time and this is the closest I've got. Um, but what I like about this, and it's already done, so I still haven't seen a flower. Um, they're tiny, they're short-lived, they're very delicate. Um, but what I like about this is we've got an insect here. These are the seeds, they're, they uh, are picked up by the wind, they go everywhere. Something else I've observed about the ball moss is that it makes a great structure for spider webs. And again, spider webs are an important food source, but not spider webs, spiders. But the webs are actually used by hummingbirds and they're an important uh, piece of the, their nest construction. The spider webs are what allow that nest to expand as the baby hummingbirds grow. And so this is what convinced me to leave my ball moss. Or, at least a majority of my ball moss. I witnessed a hummingbird nest, two babies fledged out of this nest. I know that these birds were protected because of the cover provided by the ball moss. They're very camouflaged and um, there are so many benefits of this plant. I really hope folks can uh, start um, 
paying a little more attention. And I, and mine was not an exemption. Bird expert Martin showed me that he also observed a hummingbird building next to a bomb. So I think there's a really uh, strong connection there that we need to start paying a little bit more attention to. And I guess I've gone a little bit long because it's 12.01. Um, so I'm not sure uh, I've got time. Sorry for going a little bit long. Joan, did we have any questions we wanted to try to get to? Yeah, we do. Um, so let me go back up a little bit here. Um, just a sec, let's see. Um, Let's see, first question spe specifically to the Mexican plum. Is that a larval host to any species? Gosh, let me check my cheat sheet. It is, and I'm sorry I didn't say that. Um, I think it might've been on the side, but tiger swallowtail and cecropia moth are identified as species that use that as a larval host. I I've never seen it. Um, but it is listed on the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center database uh, for that species. Mm, all right. Um, another question about Ceniso. Uh, can you explain why it's called barometer bush? Oh, uh, well that, so uh, yes, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, many people think that it predicts the weather and, and you know, it, does, it, it, it responds to the weather and so um, some people say that when you see it blooming, they think it's an indicator that it's about to rain. But what uh, happens is that the bush responds following a rain. And in the summers, um, it's particularly in October, uh, San Antonio area gets repeated rains. And so we can have these um, uh, explosions of flowers that occur while we're getting these rains. And sometimes it seems like it's right at the same time. So it does respond to moisture. It doesn't even have to be a rain. It can be a little, some kind of a microclimate that produces enough moisture that triggers the, the bush to, to flower. Um, and it can do that again, multiple times over the growing season. We're really January through December. Okay. Um, here's a question about passion flower vines. Someone's asking about how in, how invasive are they? That's a great question. So uh, some of these plants that I highlighted uh, might be a little bit weedy. Passion flower vine might be a little bit weedy for you. Vines in general um, can tend to be a little bit weedy. Um, and uh, some are harder to control than others. Uh, it can um, take over if you've got it in a more natural setting where it can move around in the ground, it, it will do that. Other ways to work with plants like that are to try them in pots, with trellises like these vines, any of these vines. Um, I've been doing that with some passion flower. And uh, this year though, what happened is I had so many Gulf fritillaries, they ate all of it down didn't kill the plant, but the, they, the butterflies kept coming and laying eggs. And so I kept finding these caterpillars that didn't har hardly have anything to eat. And so I ended up having to move probably about eight or 10 caterpillars of the Gulf fritillary to other places because the vine that I had on the trellis wasn't <laughs> enough to support all of the, the caterpillars that were on it. Ah. And that kind of goes into the, some of then followed up with wondering if you could grow passion flower vine in a container with a trellis to contain the invasiveness. So you yes. obviously have done that. Yes. And so then it's just, you know, um, it, the seeds aren't that prolific. It really, that one moves um, underground and then pops up all over the places if it's in that type of environment. But in a pot, you keep it confined. Um, other vines like the Thai vine, now that one will spread from seeds. So even if you have it in a pot on a trellis or in a, the hanging basket, um, you could get seedlings around it that might be a little bit weedy for you, but they're pretty easy to pick out. Yeah, Re well, and that leads right pot. into the, that ne the next question as well, because I believe it was during your discussion of the, the bindweed or the tie vine, um, they, they asked, how did you get it into the basket? They've been pulling it out of a bed because they thought it would choke the salvia it was growing in. Yeah, it, um, I, you know, I just find them 
around and I just, I've been putting them in different places just to try to test them out because I, I think that the flowers are uh, so nice and the fact that they do attract those hummingbirds and I've seen some really interesting solitary native bees that use it. Um, uh, I've just been trying it all, all over. <laughs> I find little seedlings and I'll just, I'll put them in a pot or put them in a, a place that has a trellis. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you know, and I think too, you can kind of let them, you know, give, give over some of your salvias to the structure that they need to climb on and, you know, and keep them both together. Oh, so right. So the person had that in their yard growing in the south. Yes, we, and I've seen it. I mean, it re, it's really up to you. Uh, I just saw it growing in the demonstration garden in downtown, um, growing up with the Greg's mist flower and thought it looked really attractive. Um, it, you know, it, it could end up somewhere where you really don't like the look, but sometimes when it's growing with other flowers, the combination of the different colors can look really uh, attractive and even in a garden setting. It's, it's up to your taste. I mean, you could try to dig it out as long as you get the root, you don't necessarily have to have the whole uh, vine, but if you get that root and get some of that soil that it's with, um, you could potentially move it somewhere else where you would like it better. Yeah. In fact, that's what a lot of people do. My, um, I move things uh, around quite a bit if I I think I, I will like it in a place or I think it might do well in a place and then it turns out I don't like it or it's not doing as well, I move it. Mm -hmm. Try a different place. Uh, let's see, someone commenting, having watched the Doug Tallamy talk, he mentioned keystone species and would like to know whether you consider this list of 10 plants as keystone species. Well, so the oak for sure. Uh, well, and I didn't even highlight the oak, the ball moss tied to the oak. I would say, you know, personally, I think this little guy is really important um, in our area. Um, I, I don't know that they would qualify, you know, there's different uses of keystone. I think they're all important. I chose these because of the observations I've made and what is known about these plants and how beneficial they are for native wildlife. Um, there are a lot of other plants too. Uh, these, except for those last two, the, the um, Thai vine and the ball moss, the other species I highlighted are, are all commonly available in the nursery trade. So one of the things about native species and, and keystone species is um, not all of our native species are available in the nursery trade, um, at least not at this time. And so you, there might be a, a perfect plant, but you won't be able to buy it at the nursery. You, you maybe can find it at a native plant sale. In fact, we carry a lot of unique native species that aren't found in the nursery trade, um, but there are thousands of native species. And really, I think it is important to think about those that provide for a wide variety of wildlife, but any of the native species that are appropriate for your area have value. And many of them have value that we just don't even know yet, we haven't discovered yet. So the key is choosing native plants that are right for your, for, for your eco region and the space that you're putting them in. Okay. Uh, and then kind of, I'm gonna combine two, because. One person asked whether there are any suggestion for more winter plants, which I guess you could consider the Ceniso a winter plant since it, it you know, on a good day, it could bloom in, uh, in January. And then someone else asked about shade plants, which is always a, a common question. Right, so I did highlight, some of the species I highlighted are good in shade and sun. So the Turk's cap is one that can take really dense shade, and you do find it in natural areas growing in the dense shade. Um, let's see, the passion flower can, go, can grow in shade. And um, there are, right, okay, so and I only did 10 species because we didn't have, uh, we, we only had an hour and I went over that. <laughs> um, there are a lot of other species and there are definitely some good shade species, I would say there are a lot of online resources that you can search uh, for shade species. There's a great book, in fact, I've got it right here. 
we give it away. Uh, it's one of the options for new members. This is the Grow Green Guide. Um, not everything in here is native, but it only has a couple that I would not recommend. For the most part, this has a lot of really good natives and it's a good resource. It's only like $2. Um, it's also so, available online. Oh, you're right. It's free online. You can you can uh, uh, find it online. Um, that the beauty of that resource is that those plants are also ones that are generally available in the nursery trade. So I would say, um, you know, there's a lot of resources. It, it, it's hard to, um, you know, list all of the, the plants right now. And I, the only one I covered that does really well in shade is the uh, Turks cat. Um, and also the native landscape certification program is another great resource to learn about a lot of the plants that are native here that, you know, would include a lot of shade plants too. So, yes. Thank you, Jen. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's another, just sort of a follow-up, just a, a, here's an idea about creating a list of keystone species for San Antonio. We should, let's do it. Work on something like that. Yes. We need another project, don't we? <laughs> well, and I just, I mean, really, I loved that talk. I would say um, it, the, the Doug Tallamy talk, um, the Batman of Mexico talk, if you didn't see either of those, they're both recorded, both available on the, the festival website. And um, they, they talk about similar themes, but a totally different, uh, you know, uh, organisms um, and geographic locations, but uh, the importance of biodiversity, the critical timing of all of this and the need for action um, across the board to provide for, think about um, uh, ways that we can bring more of these native plants into our spaces and our communities. I, I, you've got to watch those. Um, I learned a lot from both of those, they were great. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone also asked if there's, do you know of a resource on host plants for caterpillars? I'm trying to think that, um, is it the National Wildlife Federation? Do they have a, a list of something like that? I mean, we don't have it locally. I don't think that we've created. You know, I know Patty Leslie created a list oh. that I know some of the nurseries used to carry or, or carried and I've seen it. I have a copy somewhere. Uh -huh. That um, might be something worth trying to trying to locate again and then we uh, should we should something. get with Patty and and um, work something up and make it available on our website maybe. Yeah. That's a good idea. And then kind of finally here this is you know always you know could be the the topic for an entire talk back on hackberry trees, um, someone was asked, they said they were interested on the impact. She was left to believe that's an invasive trash tree and what are our thoughts since it's a larval host to many pollinators? So I almost included hackberry, but I had to narrow it down to 10 because I had already said I was gonna talk about 10 um, and it didn't make the final cut. I would say that might be one of our keystone, keystone species here because it right. is so important. The, the fruit that it produces is important for migratory birds in the fall and the winter, uh, high protein uh, food source for them. It's larval, uh, a larval host. It, it is an amazing tree and it is one of those that has that bad reputation, just like the ball moss has this bad reputation that it's a trash tree or it's um, something you need to get rid of. It does have some challenges with it. It's, it uh, tends to rot at the base when it they mature trees and that can cause problems because the entire tree can fall over from that. Uh, and it also has uh, uh, weak uh, limbs that can break off. Uh, so generally you don't want to have this necessarily right next to your house or in a place where if it were to fall over, it would be a problem. Um, but you can let it grow in other places. In fact, where I am, I've got oak wilt. And so my oak trees are going to, to die at some point um, because uh, the oak wilt is moving through the ground through connected roots. And I'm letting hackberries grow where they're coming in naturally because it is a really weedy species. Birds love those uh, fruits. And of course, that's why you end up seeing them all along fence lines. It's because the birds have eaten them, pooped out the seeds, and then the seeds um, grew into the trees. 
I'm letting them grow in places where it's not a threat for my um, building or a, uh, my, my home or, or other structures. Um, I'm letting it grow next to fences because, you know, I think it's more valuable um, to have the tree for all the benefits it provides. And if it falls on the fence, I don't mind. It's not really risking anything else. So you do have to be careful about where you, where you let them grow. All right. And actually just someone has uh, gone ahead and just thrown in some shade plants. I'll just read oh, them good. out. Cedar sage, frost weed, velvet leaf mallow, columbine, chili pekin, white ovens, American beauty berry, um, pigeon berry as well. So um, Mexican buckeye. Yeah. Texas yeah, buckeye. right. Yeah, get the, sh the shrub species in there too. Um, now we're on a roll. Yeah, I had, I couldn't think of when it came up, yeah. I just was drawing a blank. So I'm glad somebody put that in there. There are a lot. There are some great ones. Yeah. And, and I've mentioned too, that if you want, if anyone wants a copy of the chat, um, next week I'll be processing that and I can send you out a copy of it. So I, I gave my, an email address um, at the bottom here. And then also, Someone commented that um, there's butterflies and moths of North America database. Um, you can Google that and probably find um, a, also a list of host plants. Yes, that's actually my go-to resource when I'm trying to figure out what a caterpillar is or find out information on a certain butterfly or moth. It's an amazing online resource. Yeah. And well, I was going to cut off, but just one more, because I thought this was a good question. Do we need to worry about fragmentation from eight foot privacy fences? From eight foot privacy fences. Fragmentation. Well, so what a fence would do is block movement. And so anything that would not be able to go over the fence. So things that can't fly or climb, I'm just thinking a turtle. <laughs> That's a good example of some of a critter that would have a really hard time depending on the construction of the fence. <laughs> so it's a question of whether uh, what's there and would it still be able to get to the other side? Um, there's a lot of different fence types, I guess. Many designs could prevent that movement altogether or allow for that movement, just depending on what the fence was made of. If it was a totally solid material, then things couldn't get through, but things could still potentially get over. Um, but if it was opened up, sometimes um, fencing will be constructed at known wildlife crossing areas and accommodations will be made for those types of wildlife that are um, expected. At, I don't know if I'm understanding the question correctly or not, but it, it really just depends. It, it could prevent. I, I don't really think of that as fragmentation for, I think of fragmentation more so uh, much larger separations than just a fence um, where you have patches that are far removed from each other. And certainly um, those uh, prevent a lot of wildlife that, particularly the wildlife that has to move along the ground. Um, and again, turtles just come to mind to me because, you know, think about how, how turtles move around from habitat to habitat. Um, but any number of organisms um, that have to move along the ground uh, can't get to uh, other habitats if they're not connected. And so you end up having some problems with those isolated, trapped, organisms that are, are not able to uh, get out into larger areas because they're not connected. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just really a, a, a you know, result of just development in general, and then all of the backyards being fenced in um, with privacy fences. Um, and, uh, but, you know, you can do a lot by creating habitat within your yard as well. Um, and things can't, you know, there are some things that can move back and forth. So we can always start from scratch in our yards if it's a new development and put something back. They can, I mean, if you look at these natural areas, so the downtown uh, River 30 demonstration garden, for example, that's the right in downtown. There's not a lot surrounding it. It is a little oasis. 
And I've been blown away at the wildlife that has found it. And particularly these migratory birds, unusual birds have ended up there because of strange weather patterns. They find it. And, um, you know, the same can be seen in yards where people have converted their yards. Um, for the most part, yards are not um, filled with natives. They are generally non-native invasive species that a lot of turf grass, which is a lifeless environment, um, really uh, doesn't provide for, for wildlife. Um, and that's the majority of what we have out there. That's where this push is coming from is, let's reconsider this. And some of us would like to provide for, for uh, native species biodiversity, um, conserving those species, providing for monarchs, providing for migratory birds, and the way we do that is by using native plants. And, and uh, like you said, Joan, you, your yard is that way too. So you've seen it in your own yard. Um, I've seen it in mine. Uh, you know, everyone I know that has, is doing this in their yard, uh, certain uh, wildlife will find it and they will use it. And sometimes you are lucky enough to see that happen. <laughs> A lot of it happens and you don't even see it. It's just going on. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm... Um... I think I think that's about it. I've stopped sharing yours. I just I Lee, I wanted to thank you so much um, for doing this. This as always, it's just such a great presentation, and your your photos are fabulous. I'll, I'll share the text. I'll share the chat with you later because there have been some great comments on it. Um, but you know, also I'm I'm always amazed because you just realize that there's a function and purpose to everything in your yard. And, um, you know, that it just, to me, enhances the, the value and beauty of it, you know, which isn't what most people's aesthetic is, but I just knowing how much more valuable everything that I do in the yard is just, um, it's very rewarding. So um, I agree. That's where the beauty is. Uh, it, yeah. It's not necessarily, you know, that, that bindweed is a good example. It was not very attractive you know, but the beauty is in what it's providing. And when you see that it is actually um, supporting bumblebees, hummingbird, a migrating hummingbird that's only here for that moment. Yeah, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. And that's where you see the beauty in it. It's not necessarily just the aesthetics. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to wrap it all up for us. Um, and remember, I do plan on having this available, uh, the recording on YouTube uh, when I'm hopefully in in the next week or so. I'll try to make an effort to get that up and get our YouTube channel moving a little more. But um, I want you all to enjoy this wonderful weather and maybe plant some seeds because it's going to hopefully rain this week. And with the cooler weather, we might get some germination for, uh, for the spring plants. So- um, And get out and start looking around, look closely. Yes. Pay yeah. attention. Yep, we will. Okay, thanks again, Lee. And thank thanks. you everyone else. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.